Hi, thank you for coming. I'm Mark Perlin. I've started developing these kinds of systems over 20 years ago, and I'm going to tell you how to defend yourself against DNA mixtures. So Daryl Pinkins was confined to prison for many years. In 1989, in Gary, Indiana, five men were driving around in a car and doing bump and robs and bumps and beatings and then bumps and rapes, and were getting increasingly violent. And Daryl Pinkins and two other men had the misfortune of being misidentified through clothing that was stolen from their car. And in 1991, they were wrongfully convicted, and Daryl Pinkins was sentenced to 65 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Now, in 2001, through the efforts of the Innocence Project, there was DNA evidence that was collected. So, great news, there's DNA, right? However, this was standard STR DNA. There were two contributors found, a major contributor from a jacket, 80-90%, a major contributor from a sweater, about 80-90%. And so they didn't match the accused. And you think there's exculpatory evidence, life is great. But the post-conviction review board and the appellate court agreed that there were five men who were assailants, so five were needed, two new potentially exculpatory evidence items, plus three accused adds up to five. And so they stayed in jail. Okay, so there was really good DNA mixture evidence there. There were, what's a mixture? There's two or more people. It can have small amounts of DNA. Molecules can be degraded. This is what one of the electropherograms looks like uh, from one of the markers. It was fine mixture data. So if you have really good mixture data, what's the problem? Why are these men still in prison? Daryl Pinkins and Roosevelt Glenn. And the reason is there's really bad DNA mixture interpretation. The DNA mixture interpretation done 15 years ago and still done in most crime labs in this country and around the world is biased. It gives the wrong answer and the results are confusing. There are 12 other things that are wrong, but for the half hour that I have, I'm gonna focus on those three. It's biased and wrong. It doesn't use all the data. Maybe only tall peaks are used as circled here and other data is thrown out. There's no other field where you just throw out data. I mean, if your banker threw out your data because, hey, you know, you're, you're under the Donald Trump threshold this week, you know, that'd be kind of terrible. So I wanna talk first about the failure of DNA mixture interpretation as happened in this case and is still the case today and has happened in hundreds of thousands of cases. Probabilistic genotyping. What is probabilistic genotyping? I thought I'd give a simpler definition of it. There's choices with really simple data, with just two peaks, one person, lots of information. There are no choices. You just get option A. You look at the data, you're done. As soon as you have more than one option, you have option A, B, and C, and you have to, one of them could be true, you don't know which one. Then in science, all fields of science, checking the weather, whatever, now you have more than one choice and you have to give probabilities to those choices. And that's what you do in everyday life and that's what we do in science. The probabilities shown on the bottom right have to add up to 100%, whatever they are. And that's just basically the notion of the genotype variable has more than one option based on the data. That's all the word means. And so in fact, these methods from 15 years ago or also probabilistic genotyping. There's more than one option. There's just pretty bad probabilities. Bias. People choose their data in crime labs. Have you ever seen that? Okay. This is the actual process for virtually all software. The first thing is a person, a human analyst who's an expert, looks at the data and they simplify the data. They get to choose which tests are possibly you know, conforming to their standards. They get to choose which data peaks are real, what's not real. So all of that decision-making, it happens up front in simplifying the data. They have to simplify the data, the not statistical computer programs. In many labs or in subsequent rounds of analysis, they peak at the answer. That can happen. I'm sure you've seen that happen. And there are papers on that by uh, Hampiki and uh, Drawer and others. Only after the data has been simplified, the loci have been chosen, the peaks are thrown out, other peaks are kept, possibly knowing what the answer is, 
that data put into a computer program and then compared. A person first has to decide that a defendant's included. And only in that simplified case do you get the cherry on top of what a number is. That's modern software for whether it's binary, semi-continuous, or continuous, whatever these words are. That's what people do. So you put people in the process, and it's to overcome software failure, and it introduces human bias. What do I mean? Some of you flew here, and you're familiar with TSA. There are different machines you go through. On one machine, you have to take your belt off. Another one, you have to take your boarding pass out of your pocket. Another one, you have to stand on your head and do somersaults. They're all different procedures. They fail 10% of the time, which is why you get the lines, because they have to check you anyway. Why do you have to do all that? Think of yourself as the data. Somebody is preconditioning you as the data for some defective machine. Each machine's different. They don't really work very well. And each have their own failure modes. So you're the data, and you adjust data for bad software. That's what's going on with these software programs that are miscalculating math statistics. How do you misinterpret evidence? There are many ways to do that. I'll name some. Thresholds, throw out data. Dropout, amazing. Imagine you're in a case and boy, the prosecutor wished that there was a handgun next to the dead body in the alley. It isn't there. But with some probability, guy's guilty. Okay, that's dropout. Wrong data. A calibration means your model doesn't work. Otherwise, you'd solve for the answer. Incomplete. Most of the models out there for probabilistic genotyping are missing 90% of the variables. They're a little brain dead. Overconfident. They don't measure their own certainty. Really good software spends most of its time in statistics working out what it doesn't know, just like you do. Human control is great for marketing, but it introduces bias. And these programs are not sufficiently tested, and they're certainly not tested for the purposes that they're applied to. The result is DNA injustice. You have bad science leading to bad justice. When you get an inclusion, it's because a person's decided it, and they calculate the wrong number. I'll show you that in a few minutes. An exclusion is a human judgment. It's not a number. It's not a statistic. So people don't put a number to it. Inconclusive is the usual result, and that means you're discarding as potentially exculpatory evidence. That's most of locked in crime labs are hundreds of thousands of evidence items that you wish you could get to that contain real information. All right, so true allele casework. Uh, this is a project that I started on in 1999, and we spent 10 years perfecting it. Along the way, we reanalyzed data from the World Trade Center, did a number of other projects. But in 2009, we have this completely automated system that you'll hear about. A person puts in all the data. They don't select it. They don't think about it. They don't choose it. They don't see what the answer is. Put it into a computer. The computer, you tell it three or four things. How many people do you think are in there? The number doesn't really matter because validation studies show that once you have enough, the answer is the same. And how long to run it for? You can run it under all different assumptions. And then the computer runs. And what it does is it takes the mixtures and it separates out the genetic types of the people. If it's like a handgun with four people in there, it separates out those four genetic components. Now it's reduced it back to a single contributor, maybe a bit fuzzy, maybe a bit probabilistic, but it's back to where we were 20 years ago with the concepts in the math. It's just one contributor pulled out of a mixture. Computer stops, writes all this down. Later on, comparison will be made to one, 10, or a million people. Computer doesn't care. And the result is either an inclusionary number, like a million, that support that this gun matches this person relative to coincidence. That's what the number's telling you. Or it's exclusionary. It's one in a million. It could be almost anything in between and, and beyond. Okay, that's what it does. All the data, and it's an objective comparison. It's also a parallel system. In our office, we run about 100 questions simultaneously. There's a cloud capability that we could expand to. In principle, we could redo all of New York City uh, in a month if anybody asked us to. OK, what do we find with Daryl Pankins? We found five things which, in combination, no other technology can do or even attempts to do. The first thing, in order to get these results, is we had to compare evidence with evidence. So it compares not just evidence with a person, but evidence to evidence. What's the strength of association? It turns out that strength of association, which here in point number two was exclusionary. He wasn't in 
any of this evidence with match statistics of like one in a quadrillion. He's just not there. So we're comparing evidence to evidence. We're showing that Pinkins isn't in there. We're also showing that these genotypes are different from each other. We're pulling out a 5% minor contributor by doing joint analysis. The computer can look at multiple items or samples at the same time. And then when it was all done, we have five different individuals, and we showed that three of them were brothers. There were no brothers amongst the accused. And so basically, Trulio found five unidentified genotypes, and these were not the defendants, and they were not linked to the crime. So what was good about it? Well, the data interpretation was objective. The computer did not know the answers when it didn't know anything about Mr. Pinkins, Mr. Glenn, when it did the analysis. It was accurate. I'll talk to you about validation shortly. And the results are also understandable. When you're separating out mixtures into separate components, you don't need arcane likelihood ratios that only esteemed statisticians could possibly understand, certainly not your juries. It goes back to the basic concept of the probability of a match between evidence and a person divided by the probability of a coincidence, just like random match probability. This is understandable. The language is understandable. The problem with likelihood ratios, of course, is that it's an old effort to not separate the data. So you're left with complexities, which can cause legal issues as well. What's the scientific principle? It's Bayes' theorem or Bayesian update, which is what you do in everyday life. It's why you don't get hit by trucks when you cross Fifth Avenue. You assess the data to a change belief. Now, assessing data is important because some people can assess data better than others. And some software can assess the data better than others. If you have three variables, you're less sophisticated than if you have 100 variables. If you spend 15 seconds solving a problem, you're probably not going to be thinking about it the way you would if you had 100 variables to consider. But this is basic example. Suppose on the left, you think the chance of rain is maybe 10%. You have to make a decision. Do you bring your umbrella or not? This is like one of your major decisions, deciding besides what you want from Starbucks. Right? You look at the data, and the data assessing that data, the more data you look at, the more intelligently you assess it, the more information you have. And now you change your belief. What's belief? Well, there was more than one possibility. In ordinary brains and science, we associate probabilities to different events. And now our probabilities update. Yes, the probability of rain is 60%. You've probably gone past some limit. Now you'll bring your umbrella, right? So your probability has changed. You had some set of beliefs before. There's data, and you update your beliefs. And now you achieve some new state of beliefs afterwards. That's it. The rest is details. That's all that's going on in these Bayesian computer programs, if they're Bayesian. Very important, all the data, all the time. No choice. You don't have any choice. You have to use all the data. I mean, there are exceptions. There are huge blobs or something. It, it rarely happens. There can be bizarre artifacts. So basically, all the data, all the time. And if you don't do that, by Bayes' theorem, your answer is wrong. You can write down the math and show it's just wrong. Maybe a little wrong, maybe a lot wrong, but it's wrong. You need to use all locus tests. You need to use all data peaks. Forget thresholds. Statistics can figure out to what extent to use data. And a key concept in modern statistical reasoning, Bayes was around 250 years ago, but until the advent of ubiquitous digital computing about 30 years ago, he couldn't be used. Now it's the main way of doing calculations. You don't need thresholds. The idea is whatever the data is in front of you, that's your starting point. Don't touch it. That's your evidence, right? Is it ethical for the police to toss out evidence because some statistician told them to? No, not really. You use all the evidence. It's the models that have to figure out how this works. There's no concept of putting in dropout parameters. It's basically, here's the data. Try out lots of different patterns. Good patterns will give higher probability lower patterns that don't resemble the data will have lower probability to the genotypes. Unbiased. You have to consider all the variables. You can't just consider a few possibilities. I mean, if you wanted to make a really fast computer program out of the thousand possible allele pairs that you might want to consider, maybe a hundred allele pairs, maybe you'd only consider six. That's fast. Maybe you wouldn't consider all the possibilities what those variables can do. That's fast, but it's wrong. You'll get wrong answers. There should be no choices, and you have to do very thorough testing. Essentially, 
if you're going to use Bayes' theorem, which is modern probabilistic modeling, you have to use all the data and all the variables and consider all the possibilities. If you don't, the math doesn't work. How do we know that this method works called Trillial? There's been 31 validation studies, seven of them published in peer-reviewed journals. This is one of them shown on the bottom in Journal of Forensic Sciences. This is a publication from last year. It talks about genotype identification on laboratory synthesized mixtures that go up to five unknown contributors. Another lab has tested up to six unknown contributors. Another lab is finishing up its validation on 10 unknown contributors. And what this works out is the basic aspects of reliability. If you know the person's in there, are you finding him with some match statistic? If you know the person's not in there, are you not finding her with some match statistic? And if you run the program multiple times, do you get reasonably close answers based on the random sampling? Those are the main axes, and every study will have other axes as well. This one, for example, looked at what happens if you have excess contributors. We're scientists, and we look at other things. But the question is, is this a reliable method? They also provide error rates. If you're in a Daubert state, the validation studies give you most everything you need for Daubert. There are other measures for Fry as well. Okay, so the concept of justice in this case and in others is that to report an inclusionary stat, you need an objective and accurate match statistic. That's what's coming into court, is the match statistic. It should be accurate, not made up. If it's an exclusion, it should be based on math, like it was done here, numbers like one in a quadrillion, not in, oh, in my opinion, I don't think he's in there, or maybe he's in there, I don't know, or maybe it's inconclusive. When Trulio gives an inconclusive, it means the match statistic that he calculates is around one, maybe one-tenth or ten. It's a number that's not six zeros or one over or one followed by six zeros. It's kind of like no zeros. It's around one. It's also critical to say that the process with Trulial is you determine the statistics first, and then you go back and look at what's going on. You don't look at the data and then figure out what statistics you want. So Trulial found five unidentified genotypes that were not linked to the crime, and Mr. Pinkins was released on April 25th of this year, there was supposed to be a hearing. I was getting all set to go out to Indiana to join Dr. Greg Hampikian and law professor Francis Watson. And I had just given a talk of my direct exam presentation, 30 slides, to the law school at Duquesne, to an interested forensics class. As I got into the taxi heading back, ready to pack and go out to Indiana, I get this text saying, they're not gonna have a hearing because the district attorney is so persuaded by the science that there's no point in having a hearing. You'd never be able to convict them again anyway. So that's the power of really good, accurate science that isn't bad science or BS. I think that's the technical term in law. <laughs> okay, so is anybody aware that there's a problem? Are the forensics labs on notice that all this has been nonsense for 15 years? Yeah. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Dr. John Butler, did an interesting study in 2005 called Mix 05. We sent out two person mixtures to 50 to 100 laboratories and asked, what's your match statistic on this simple mixture? Most labs said it was inconclusive. Think potentially suppressed exculpatory evidence. Right? That's, that's a take home message today. And the other labs gave numbers. There were like 29 labs, and their numbers ranged from four zeros after the one, 10,000, to 14 zeros after the one, 100 trillion, all on the same data. And this was widely disseminated in the community. Everybody knew there was a problem. So the FBI developed some standards. One threshold didn't work. What if we have two thresholds? OK. So they did this 2013 study on mixtures, the mix 13 study. And on one of the cases, they had a mixture that was complex that had three or four contributors in it. And there were standards to compare against. And 70 out of 100 labs falsely included this person who wasn't in this laboratory easy synthesized mixture and gave a match statistic. So that's roughly the value of match statistics. There's a paper that I wrote based on some interesting data that uh, we had from the crime lab about the combined probability of inclusion, or CPI. We basically showed it's a random number generator. There's no probative value in the number. 
It's uncorrelated with identification information. It always includes, and it follows half the shape of a bell curve. It doesn't mean anything. Papers online, just type in my name and look up inclusion probability, random number or something, it'll come right up. And essentially, it's just counting tests using the law of large numbers. If you have more money and you do 20 STR tests, you'll get twice as many zeros on average than if you do 10 tests. But remember, in the subjective biased human lab process, the whole point is to just put a number to what the analyst has already determined. So in some sense, it's reasonable. It's a non-probative number that's window dressing for court that puts into a number what somebody's already said in their report. So there's, there's nothing evil going on. It just doesn't mean anything. In fact, there was an interesting thing that we observed in other studies that preceded this. For some reason, the 13 CODIS loci, you always get a six zeros after the one. It's always a million. Oh, it's 100,000. It's 10 million. It's always around a million. It's like a clock that's stuck at six o'clock, right? If you don't look at the clock, it's inconclusive. Your answer is, I don't know what time it is. If you do look at the clock, the answer is six o'clock. I got six zeros after the one. That's most of what's been reported out in this country. It's just either it's six or I don't know. The labs knew about this. Here are two studies. They were not intended for this comparison purpose, but in retrospect, they can be used. They came out of the New York State Police Lab, and they were interested in making comparisons to show for themselves that true allele was, was doing at least as well as people. That's a good comparison. And these are published. I think they're in your materials. If you're not, contact me. We try to make everything open access online. The first paper was 2000. And 11, and it asked the question if the lab gets a match statistic using CPI or CLR, but let's focus on CPI, what's the real answer with true allele? And the answer was with CPI, in retrospect, they always got a million. And then true allele would get whatever the information is. Some other studies show that the number can be higher or lower that establish the accuracy statistically of true allele. It can be anything between nothing and a trillion trillion. But in this study, True allele did at least as well as guessing that the answer is a million. The second study was published in 2013, and now we flip the question. If the computer got an answer, this looked at about 85 matches, what did the lab get? The computer's answer on average was about at a quadrillion as a match statistic for inclusionary results. The lab gave no answer 70% of the time. So it's an interesting study if you're trying to get at data and figure out what isn't being disclosed to you that's in data that governments produce that the state is holding onto, say it again, as potentially exculpatory evidence that isn't being interpreted properly and just called inconclusive when indeed it's super highly informative. Okay, what does this have to do with your life? You're not going to win many admissibility. It's fine. You should try it. I think it's great. But what are the rules? With rule 702, the bottom line is the data's got to be reliable, the method's got to be reliable, and the result when you apply the method to the data is basically supposed to be reliable. So what do we see? Well, actually, the data coming off the sequencers of the genetic analyzers is quite good when you get started, but then it enters into the realm of lab interpretation. And now we end up with unreliable data as the computers will see them. People are choosing their data. They're introducing bias. They're discarding data with thresholds and decisions. Oh, I think that's stutter. Maybe it's not stutter. Let me take a look. <laughs> you know, what is it? That is the look at your defendant. Adding peaks that aren't there with dropout is crazy when you have actual statistical modeling that's normative in the rest of science, where if the patterns are close, probabilities are higher. If the patterns that you're proposing are not close, the probabilities are lower. Don't concoct evidence. And long answers are pretty much guaranteed if the data is unreliable, that's actually filtered and massaged and manipulated before it goes into a computer program. What about the method? Well, a lot of the methods don't make very valid use of DNA data because they're not following Bayes' theorem. They're taking shortcuts, speed ups, approximations, fewer variables. And when they test methods, the validation testing is unrealistic. Oh my God, it works fantastic on 50, 50 two person mixtures. Well, CPI from PopStats works perfectly well on 50, 50 two person mixtures with abundant DNA. And then you go out and apply it to a four person mixture with a 1% contributor. That's crazy, right? You have to have realistic testing 
to show that it's the method is suitable for the data. And the results end up being unreliable. Think of this as a shorthand for the last step of rule 702. The testing has only been done on limited samples. It's not validated for what you're really going to use it for. It's certainly not applicable to the case data if the case data is far more interesting than the validation studies. And the report language can be very confusing. If you're using methods that don't separate mixtures, you're trying to use language trying to explain, I've got four people in here and there's this hypothesis of a prosecutor and there's some hypothesis of a defender, which the prosecution chose, go figure. And there's conditional probabilities and there's likelihoods and that's just not evident to, to a jury. So a lot of opportunities for cross-exam if you learn how. As opposed to just saying, hey, there's a match between the gun and this guy is a million times more probable than coincidence. Sounds like random match probability because basically it is. Rule 403, you can actually get a little bit more on this. I've actually testified at a hearing for a defendant where DNA was excluded on not being relevant. So the problem with DNA is that it's incredibly prejudicial. Do not acquit. That's what DNA stands for. So when the jury hears, do not acquit, that's what it stands for, they may not, even if the DNA is completely irrelevant and confusing and misleading. And why is that? Because on the other side, what's being proffered by the prosecution, that number usually has no probative value. It's a random number. It's not properly validated. It can't even be exclusionary. There's a lot missing. And yet that number is presented and many defenders just you know, go into a fetal position and hope it was a dream. But that's not what DNA evidence is. Most of what you've been cowering in fear from is really junk science because it's the stat that's gonna be presented in court. And those stats are not and have not been and probably going into the future even with fancy software will not be reliable, and they're going to be unduly prejudicial if they're not really backed up by solid science. Here's a summary of software. Most software gives wrong answers. It introduces bias because otherwise it can't even work. It gives confusing results in terms of complex mathematical statements that you will never understand and nor will anybody else, probably not even the lab analyst who's testifying. And it's very limited in its applicability. I'm making these statements about true allele only because we've done 30 or others have done 31 validation studies and we test it and we keep testing it. We want to keep pushing it. It's accurate. It's objective because it's designed that way. It can't, can't game the system. It doesn't know what you're looking for. It's just separating out genotypes. It has no idea what you even want to compare it with. The results are in plain English and they're understandable and it's universally applicable. We keep doing validations. So the late, again, one's going out to 10 unknown contributors. What do you need to do about this situation? Why are you here today? What's the take home message? You need to be really vigilant, right? You're here because you respect the process, right? That's why you're here. If people are using software to calculate match statistics, make sure it's contained within the valid limits. Somebody comes in with pop stats, CPI, 50-50 mixture, lots of DNA, two people, fine. That's a great stat. But if someone's coming in with old or newfangled software that go far beyond what anybody's proven it can do, don't let them do that. That's your job, right? Who else is a counterweight in the, in the legal system to make sure that doesn't happen? It's you, nobody else. And when they go outside those limitations, Expose it, reveal it, probably on cross-exam, not an admissibility hearing, but make it clear that these results are not reliable. And that will help the system keep reliable evidence in court and keep out unreliable evidence. It's not the software itself, it's the misuse of limited software. So here are some recommendations. If you understand that most DNA mixture statistics, past, present, and future, are wrong, biased, and confusing, First, you need a lot of education. This is a good start. I'm starting to work with some defenders to create day-long workshops. If there's interest, send me an email. We're interested in educating defenders and everybody, judges, prosecutors, police, high school students, anybody who cares about what is DNA, what does it mean, what's good, what's bad, and how to tell the difference. You need to move to a world 
we need to move to a world when you get bad results, inaccurate match statistics, they're verified. And these are projects that I'm working on. We're starting this on a smaller scale in some other cities, but the idea is to just use true allele automation to recheck every statistic that's coming out of a crime lab. Why? It's automated. We don't need to hire 10,000 people to do anything and filter the data and put it into software that's so limited unless you have people who won't even operate. We can do all this, we could do it on the internet, we can do it quickly. So these are projects that we're looking at. At this point, everything's pro bono, but you're familiar with that. And verify the results. Don't take it at face value that somebody says the match statistic is a gazillion and it's your guy that it actually means anything. Trust but verify. Where have you heard that? You need a lot of cross-exam to elicit the truth. What really went in? What were the assumptions? What are the limitations? What's going on? The basic questions of, do you know how the DNA was left? Those are all good questions. But the real questions are going to have to be with, why are your methods not working? Or why don't they work in this case? You're going to have to learn a little bit more. You don't need to learn about MCMC and math and statistics and linear regression. You just need to understand where the defects are. If you have a basic degree in English or history, you'll be fine. And the other thing is to, this is another set of projects I'm working on, is to expose the sins of the past. If we know, for example, that there are over 5,000 cases in New York State where they got the wrong number or they got it inconclusive where the number should have been conclusive, that needs to be opened up and revealed. It is not just the potentially exculpatory evidence remains hidden. States like Texas are reanalyzing 24,000 misinterpreted DNA mixtures. We're in the North, right? Right? We're supposed to be like really into rights and Texas has it all over us. If you want to learn more about this, we've got, you could spend two years on our website watching all the presentations and reading all the articles and so on, which by the way, we now are putting onto discovery DVDs that won't fit on a CD whenever we're involved in a case. I should also add that in terms of transparency, we offer the other side. We don't care what side we're on. We've done hundreds of cases, over 30 for defenders and lots of innocence cases. You can have the software. Here are the keys. Take the Lexus, drive it for a month, for a year. Do your own validation study. We don't care. We know it works. We have nothing to hide. That's one of many ways in which there's transparency. But you can read about this. Check out the YouTube channel if you have questions or you're interested in learning more, or even I'd be interested to know how many people would be interested in a workshop uh, where you spend a day practicing cross-exam on these questions. Let us know. So now, having said that, I think I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>